Let's talk about abnormal behavior. To introduce this to you, I wanted to show you a clip from a movie that I just love. It's called Young Frankenstein. And in this clip, Dr. Frankenstein is talking to his assistant about the brain that he chose, that they put in the monster. Let's check it out. Whose brain I did put in? And you won't be angry? I will not be angry. Abby someone. Abby someone. Abby who? Abby normal. Abby normal. I'm almost sure that was the name. Are you saying that I put an abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long, 54 inch wide gorilla? So you can see, it's it's hilarious. When talking about abnormal behavior, it's always good to start out by defining what is normal. And we're gonna look at that from two different perspectives, an individual perspective and a societal perspective. We all know that this can be defined many ways and we all have our own definition of normality, but for the sake of this class, we'll just we'll focus at it from these two perspectives. So when we're talking about an individual, we can define their normal behavior as behavior that is consistent and expected. So when I say consistent and expected, I mean it's normal for that that person in that context. So let's use an example of you've been raised your whole life uh, and your mom has taught you to take off your shoes when you enter the house. But that one day you have to run in and get something real quick. You leave your shoes on and your mom catches you. Well, how does your mom respond? She reacted in, with anger. That reaction for her in that circumstance is normal. Normal behavior from a societal perspective is conforming to those expectations that are set forth by the society. Some great examples of normal behavior in a society are like when you get a cart at a grocery store and you return it after you use it. We all kind of look sideways at people when we see them put their cart off in the parking lot knowing that it could run into another's car or something like that. That's kind of one of those unwritten rules or an example of one of those unwritten rules like, hey, you're supposed to do that. Another awesome example is how we stand in line. As we stand in line, we form an orderly fashion and we take our turn and it's typically first come, first serve. In some cases, it's the more urgent gets to go first. And so when people subvert those rules, when they get in front of us when they got there after us, it kind of makes us feel weird. And that weird feeling is they're behaving outside of the norm. They're not keeping their part of that social contract or those unwritten social rules. So again, just a quick understanding of what is normal. It's how we behave in society and individually. So flipping that coin, what is abnormal? Well, abnormal is behavior that is disturbing, meaning when we see it happening, it makes the viewer uncomfortable. Abnormal behavior is also behavior that is socially unacceptable, meaning it doesn't fit those unwritten rules that we've established as a society. And finally, abnormal behavior is self-defeating or self-limiting. It interferes with an individual's day-to-day -day function. Now, in all of our experiences, we've probably described people as being abnormal or weird. There are four specific criteria that define what pathological abnormal behavior looks like, and that means a diagnosable form of abnormal behavior. So at least one of the following four criteria need to be present in order to define an individual's behavior as as truly abnormal. The first one being the violation of social norms, meaning they violate those social contracts or social rules that are unwritten that we have with one another in a society. But there are exceptions. The first being that these social rules or norms can vary from culture to culture, meaning what's okay in one country or nation or family or community isn't necessarily okay in another. And we have to be aware of those rules. Using this as an example, we can compare the United States to the UK. We have similarities in that we we both speak English and we have some other common things just because we're human, but because our cultures are different, there are different social rules. Like in the US, we're openly emotional for the most part. It's okay to cry in public, it's okay to be angry, be frustrated and express those emotions for the most part. But individuals from the UK are seen as having what, what they call a stiff upper lip. So emotion is subdued, they're more reserved. So if you were traveling in either country and express their form of, of emotionality, you might might be looked at a little bit differently. Another point to take note in, in talking about the violation of social norms is that they can vary from age to age. So let's say a three-year-old and a 30-year-old were in a store and the three-year-old running around the store pulling items off the shelf and throwing a, t a tantrum. You would see that as odd but understandable for the age of the child. Whereas if a 30-year-old demonstrated that behavior, you would likely be calling the police. And there's also this idea that it's not the same generationally. So behavior 
behavior that's normal for millennials isn't necessarily going to be the same acceptable behavior for baby boomers. And a great example of that is tattoos. Tattoos are commonplace. It's almost abnormal to not have a tattoo in our day and age. Whereas previously, it was it was a symbol of, of rebellion and something that very few people had. So these are just some things to take note of when identifying if a person is in violation of social norms. The second criterion of assessing abnormal behavior is that it is a statistical rarity. So let's say this circle represents the population as a whole. The black dots represent the majority of the population who are demonstrating the same behavior. And the red dots are demonstrating individuals who have a different behavior that is different from the norm. Under this definition, because they are rare, they are a statistical rarity, the behavior that they're exhibiting would be considered abnormal. Now there are caveats to this, or limitations, and one of them being shown by this bell curve that I've just drawn. And in this, let's say we're measuring IQ. So when you talk about a normal distribution or a bell curve, you're saying that within these parameters, this is where most of the population falls between these two scores. And if they fall on the outside or are known as outliers, they are considered abnormal because there are so few of them. You can see that the sheer number that are in the center is much greater than those who are in this small teeny space. But we have those who, who have a lower IQ on this end and those who have a higher IQ on this end. And so by definition, what we're saying that if they're a statistical rarity, when they have a higher IQ, they're considered abnormal as well. And so that's kind of a limitation to this to this criterion. And this could be true also of those who are extremely talented, like athletes or artists. The third criterion in this list is the inability to function. So this is when our behavior becomes so disruptive that we aren't able to cope with or manage the everyday demands of life or the everyday stressors that we come into contact with. This includes things like self-care, like brushing your teeth, going to bed, getting dressed, work, and social interactions. So when our behavior interrupts with these things, that's when you have dysfunction. That's when you have abnormality. It's typically accompanied with a negative emotional reaction that is self-focused. Things like self-harm or cutting, anxiety, or irrational fears. Also, OCD could be included in that. Now, it's important to note at this point that when discussing these things, oftentimes we say things like, I'm having an anxiety attack or I'm, I have a phobia of this. We use those terms to describe ourselves, but really we're just saying that we're really afraid of that. And really we're, we're falling within the range of normality. When we're talking about abnormal behavior, we have to remember that it means we can't cope with the day-to-day -day stresses. We're not able to function normally. We're not able to dress ourselves, to care for ourselves. So yes, we are having anxiety or a higher level of anxiety, or we are experiencing a serious fear. But when it doesn't interfere with our day-to-day -day functioning, we're, we're still in that safe zone. So keep that in mind. It's also important to point out that some risky behaviors that we would feel fall into this are socially acceptable, like jumping out of an airplane, drinking, and smoking. So we've decided as a society that certain behaviors are okay, even though they may cause us harm. They're not considered abnormal. And finally, the last criterion is our behavior. If considered abnormal, it would deviate from the ideals of mental health. Now, there are six ideals of mental health, and the first is a positive self-view. The capacity for growth and personal improvement, independence, an accurate perception of reality, positive social relationships or interactions, and finally, the ability to meet the demands of day-to-day -day life. So these six traits or factors were laid out to describe an individual who would have perfect mental health. Their behavior should fall within the normal range, right? But again, as with most things, there are some caveats. There are some limitations. The first being that we are human. We cannot be perfect all the time. We experience things like death or other hardships that impact us that maybe mess with our ability to cope with the day-to-day -day or mess with, for a time, our capacity for growth and improvement. So we can't see these things and expect to fill, fulfill them like a checklist. We're going to kind of have some deficits here and some, some real positives in some areas, but as long as we're generally okay, we fall within that range of normal behavior. If we were 
were to have deficits in all of these factors, then we would likely fall into a deviation from mental health and thereby have or demonstrate abnormal behaviors. So there we have it. In this lesson, we were able to quickly define what abnormal behavior was and the four criteria that need to be present, or at least one needs to be present, in order to identify it. And they were falling outside those social norms, statistically rare, the disruption of day-to-day -day function, and falling outside those mental health ideals, those six factors. Hopefully next time we can talk more about some of the specific disorders that are the manifestations of abnormal behavior.